All right. Well, welcome everybody to the next installment of the Interfaith Chaplaincy Interview Series. Um, we have another wonderful guest today. Um, my name is uh, J.M. Dixon, um, an intern here at Interfaith Philadelphia. And let's go ahead and meet our uh, guest today. So have them go ahead and introduce himself. So. Oh, uh, hello, I'm Levi Walbert. Um, I'm a student at Moravian Theological Seminary currently, um, ordained with the Bright Dawn, which is a uh, non-denominational Buddhist uh, organization that we come from Jodo Shinshu, uh, which is what I practice. Um, yeah, I I've done a lot of work uh, interning with chaplains through my educational process from undergrad into graduate school. So, you know, I'm happy to be here and talk about my experience uh, and whatever I can help with that. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be great. So, um, can you just speak a little bit more about your um, religious background? Sure. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm a Buddhist. Um, I practiced uh, what's called Jodo Shinshu, which is a Japanese form of Pure Land Buddhism. And I always say it's kind of interesting because it's actually the most practiced form of Buddhism in Japan, but it's very not well known in the West. Uh, okay. It's still very much practiced, uh, at least I think by majority um, people with a Japanese ancestry and background. And of course, there's Chinese and Vietnamese and all Asian um, variants of Pure Land Buddhism, but Jodo Shinshu uh, it comes from the Japanese side of it. Um, and, you know, there's a various factors of that, and I'm very lucky to have uh, been educated in it. Um, you know, I'd gone through a, about a two-year, uh, more or less, seminary program um, uh, where I was trained under my, my, my late teacher now um, and ordained through that process. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a Buddhist a Buddhism that is uh, fully non-monastic, which is kind of rare. So it's why I have hair yet. Um, it's pulled back now, but I have quite a, quite a lot of it. Uh, in that sense, I, we use the term minister. Um, the, the actual term is uh, generally uh, kind of tracked down to uh, probably butcher the pronunciation, but hizo hizokai, which means neither monk nor layperson, which is kind hmm. of following the tradition of the founder, Shinran. And it's Buddhism for the people. Um, you know, it has, uh, it's Buddhism based on entrusting uh, uh, what we call other power, uh, one which ego is uh is given up in trust of that other power so it's it's buddhism down to its core but it's just a different approach to what i think a lot of americans are very familiar with uh very familiar with a lot of zen a lot of kind of what we call a uh, path of right. sages super monistic and uh, i have nothing bad to say about them I, I quite love the zen tradition but it's not the path i'm following but uh, yeah that's a just a little bit of a general uh overview i guess if, uh, if you have you know, I can go into Buddhism more, but that's, uh, if you know the basics, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've got a, a question here in the chat. So um, it's, as a Buddhist, how did you find your way to a Moravian seminary? Yeah, I didn't actually know anything about the Moravians, um, just as a, as a group. <laughs> uh, funny enough, though, I, I, after going there, I learned that my, um, my best friend's family, I grew up across the street from them, that the mother was Moravian her whole life. Uh, so I've been around them. I just didn't make the connection. Uh, <laughs> how did I get there? I, I just, you know, I thought seminary was interesting. You know, there's a lot of different paths you could go in towards it. And it was at kind of a, at a difficult place in my life and kind of opportunities. So I, I, was, I, had, I had the time where I had a lot of time. Um, and so I said, you know what, I'll take a class. I'll just take one class, see how I like it, see what's going on. And, you know, I was hooked. Um, I found my way to Moravian specifically because I, I kind of joke about this, but um, I say that, well, they were the only ones who would accept me. Um, and I don't say that as, uh, again, somewhat of a joke, but it was an issue where I looked at the different seminaries in my general area and uh, just the, that had the programs I was looking for. And a lot of them kind of had, oh, well, you know, maybe we can, we can kind of move things around for you as a Buddhist or, you know, we can kind of work with you, but Moravian was really uh, excited at the possibility of having me and having that interfaith view. And it was, it was not a, um, an issue of, well, maybe we can do something. It was, oh, we absolutely can and we want to. Right. So I felt very, very open, very welcomed. And, uh, you know, I always say that as I went into seminary, I was always a little bit 
apprehensive. You know, what is this going to be like for me as someone uh, not within the Christian faith tradition? And, you know, I'm very proud and open to say that I've had absolutely no pushback. I have no, you know, uh, no evangelism. No, no. It was just such a, uh, everyone I, I've met at the seminary has been so open and so happy to have me and talk about the interfaith uh, uh, dialogue and just, uh, yeah, I, I had no, no problems at all. I'm happy to report. So, you know, I went there and made a good impression. I said, oh, well, I've got to stick with it now. And I actually quite love the Moravians and the Moravian tradition. I'm taking a theology, a Moravian theology course as my final class there. So very right, happy right. about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's great to hear. I, I think that's the kind of thing that'll be interesting to see in the future with, with seminaries and these kind of programs as, as Christianity kind of is no longer the dominant force it used to be in this country and how that'll be in the future going forward. But um, yeah, and that's something else too that I think is always interesting hearing people study Christianity for people who are not followers of the religion. So people like yourself who, who get interested in it and, you know, you, you can, as I always say, you don't have to be a uh, um, believer in Greek religion to study about Zeus and, and that oh, kind yeah. of thing. Same kind I, of thing. Yeah. I think there's a lot of benefits to that. I mean, I actually am very excited to read Buddhist texts and Buddhist analysis to people, to people who aren't Buddhism, uh, who aren't uh, involved in Buddhism outside of academia, just because, um, right. Some of these, it's there's some great insights that uh, yeah. you know they're not tied to something. They're not a theologically right. you're you know, practice uh, doing a practice, but they're really tied to a certain view, and uh, it can be very liberating. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I I, <laughs> I definitely know people who are skeptical of people who are like, oh, that person is not a Christian, and they're writing about the Bible, you know. But it's 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 just exactly it's about yeah. Yeah, and of course, you have to make sure you know where they're coming from. There are right. people who do write from that who are you know, not genuine. But anyway, that's not the point here. Right. But yeah, no, I did want to ask more about your, your background because sure. we actually, the last, um, uh, the last chaplain we met with on Monday was, was also a Buddhist. So I, as, and of course, she was already talking about how just diverse Buddhism is. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite massive. I, you know, I always say Jodo Shinshu in particular. Uh, I think it has not caught on in America because it some of the outward presentation of it doesn't ring to what I think a lot of Americans think Buddhism is. I think it is completely in line with everything I understand about fundamental Buddhism. But, um, you know, it, it can present itself almost more like Christianity, which I think is where it gets a bad, you know, I don't want to say a bad rap, but people misunderstand it. They think, oh, this is just some Christian Buddhism because we, I guess, they, we use, translate the word faith as the main thing. and We hmm. have this kind of cosmic Buddha as the main centerpiece right. of the religion. But, but it's, when you actually look into it, it's, there's a lot of difference. Um, and it is just, it's fundamentally Buddhism. It's just presented in a different way. Right. And something I asked turn, I, I feel like I want to ask you too, is, is do you feel, and I think you were kind of talking about this a little bit already, but is there something that you feel like people often misunderstand about uh, your faith tradition and just some common misconceptions you encounter a lot? And Yeah, um, I think the, the biggest misunderstanding and the biggest thing I encounter is, is really uh, the kind of this growing trend of the attempts to secularize Buddhism. I know there's a mm. kind of, uh, I say, quote unquote, secular Buddhism as people kind of trying to make a, a new sect or, or kind right. of doctrine. And it's fundamentally not Buddhism anymore. Um, right. I, I'm very open to say, I think anybody of any faith tradition or lack of faith tradition can take whatever they would like from Buddhism if it helps them. Right. Uh, there's no gatekeeping there. But uh, there has been a number of people who fundamentally chop out core sections of Buddhism and now we're trying to present it as, well, this is real Buddhism. Uh, right. This is, this is Buddhism uncorrupted. Right. And unfortunately there is a, a pretty massive amount of uh, you know, white colonialism I, is the only way to say it. Um, yeah. This has actually been happening since the 18th century where, you know, Europeans would come back and say, well, here's Buddhism, but here's a, a Buddhism, Buddha was clearly a, a white Aryan, which is something you actually do see in the history books. Uh, and, and, you know, all of these, uh, the Indians corrupted the message with all these metaphysical things. Actually, he's like Socrates. He's just a philosopher. There's nothing right. religious about it, which is just fundamentally not Buddhism. So I think right. the biggest misunderstanding is that, that, uh, you know, there's 
uh, you can be a Buddhist with, with basically rejecting the core doctrines of Buddhism. Uh, I yeah. always say, um, uh, just to illustrate it, you would never, you'd be very confused in America if someone came up to you and said, oh, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't actually believe Jesus was God, or I don't believe in heaven, or I don't actually believe that there's a personal God out there, and I don't believe in salvation or sin. It's like, you know, you, okay, well, that kind of sounds like you just agree with some of the ethics. doesn't doesn't make you a Christian anymore. Right. It seems you. And so it's weird that I think a lot of, uh, I'll be honest, particularly white people um, feel that they can do that to Buddhism, that they can kind mm -hmm. of just chop it up and just take whatever they they like from it. It's uh, it, there's a lot of issues with it. I can go on about this forever because it's a very um, important thing to me, but I, I don't think that's the main topic of our talk today. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about it any other time, but uh, I try to want to be conscious about why I'm here. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll come swing back around. I, that did remind me one real quick of, I've, I've always heard all these stories people write about where they say, oh, well, you know, Jesus traveled to India and like influenced, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism. I'm like, okay, sure. But <laughs> it feels like that same kind of like, you know, well, it had to come yeah. from, yeah, it's. I, I, on that, I, I love the idea. I love, I love imaginary dialogues. I think that's a very good right. Cool yeah, that's idea, different. Yeah. I, I think it devalues both 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 the religions because they're both amazingly unique and wise and the idea that like well one had to influence the other it's like, like they both grew on their own and there's amazing dialogue and, and correspondence that we can talk about but you know i yeah i, I don't want to disrespect christianity especially saying oh well, jesus learned from buddhists no he, he <laughs> did his own thing and that's amazing right <laughs> so yeah let's let's yeah get into the chaplaincy part <laughs> so, sure yeah a little bit about your experience with that yeah <laughs> yeah so i think the first time i really had the interest in chaplaincy and the first uh taste i got of it is uh, i did my um undergraduate work in philosophy and then my minor was in bioethics so of course okay. a lot of the ethics that goes along um uh, with medical yeah. work yeah. so i was very lucky that my um advisor for bioethics was also the head of the philosophy department and he had a seat on the ethics council for uh, a local hospital, a pretty, pretty large okay. local hospital. And, you know, we uh, talked about it. He actually was able to uh, set me up with an internship with the chaplaincy uh, or the, uh, the pastoral care unit for the hospital and also be able to kind of uh, work with the ethics board and sit on ethics board meetings and intern with them. Uh, so I got to do that for my final year in undergraduate work. So I um, was there I think, twice a week for quite a few hours um excuse me uh and, and yeah i shadowed the chaplains uh and i was able to sit in ethics board meetings and it was a really amazing opportunity um i learned i think years later and i'm still processing this that medical chaplaincy is not for me uh it right. is one of the most amazing and important works uh, i've ever seen it's really foundational for what just for my own spiritual practice and my own outlook on it. They're amazing people, uh, medical chaplains. And I say this in the best way possible. They all have a spark of madness that I think you need in that field. Uh, there's no normal medical chaplain and that's a very good thing, but uh, I don't think I'm cut out for that work. I did a lot, I did work in the trauma unit in neuro ICU. And some very, there are very difficult things there. Uh, and I had some amazing experiences that I'll keep with me for the rest of my life. But um, I, yeah, I don't think the medical aspect is for me. I'm a very uh, medically nervous person. That didn't help. Um, but it did lead me into chaplaincy, the idea of caring for people and caring for people in a religious context um, that I think that chaplaincy has that's different from being a pastor or being a priest. That's mm -hmm. a really wonderful thing and they care for people, but uh, chaplains almost have a more openness. I don't wanna say openness personally, but they have some more freedom of how they can approach things. Right. The, uh, the priest or pastor has a role and it's an important role to fill, but I think that I've right. seen a lot more um, this variability in, in ways that chaplains can approach things. And I think that's uh, that's a strength and weakness in different areas, but it's something I thought was more viable for me than going to a more 
uh, uh, priestly role. And I think one that just uh, my own training I've received, my religious education is more apt to that. Right. And I, I mean, that's sometimes some of my best lessons in life have been realizing, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. In one. Yeah. So, yeah. It's important to know what you can't do just as much as what you can do. Right. And I, I just want to highlight, I love the, the spark of madness. As you said, <laughs> can you, you talk about that a little bit more? Cause I, I, I think I know what you're talking about, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint, but I mean, um, yeah. I say that because there is so much that you have to see and go through right. on a daily basis. And I, I say that spark of madness in the sense of you have to be a very special person yeah. to have the ability to process that and the ability to, to, to put up, I don't want to say walls, but ways of separating that trauma and that sadness that comes with it from your personal life to be able to keep going each day. I, right. I think people without that, uh, for me, for instance, I had a very hard time. I think I realized later on separating that and something it had to work through and it's probably still working through. Uh, mm -hmm. And I realized that I just, um, I would have to leave a very strange, different life entirely to be able to do that kind of work. Um, and I just don't think, I think at a certain time, I would not be good at it. I, I think I would burn myself out so quickly and I would probably be a detriment to the people I'm supposed to be caring for. So I, I had to make that choice to say, I, I can't go into that line of work. I support people. Uh, I, I've written to the hospital, say, hey, these are important people. You've got to take care of them. Um, yeah. But it's just, uh, it's better for me not to go into that line. Uh, but yeah, the spark of madness, I mean, they're just strange people. Um, people who come from really unique backgrounds, each of them. I don't think anyone came from a very traditional, normal, average background, but people who came from, you know, some of them came from a lot of suffering and a lot of hardship and they were tempered and learned a lot and had gained immense compassion from that. People who have just you know, backgrounds I can't even begin to, you know, understand, but I, I think you need some of that. Um, right. It comes with a certain kind of wisdom that can only be earned. And I don't think you can learn it from a, from a, from a classroom. Yeah, no, I, I, and I've, I have several uh, friends I know who, who've done chapel experience and, and some of the ones who said they had the toughest times are the people that I would think of as the most empathetic, like, oh, yeah. you know, you'd be great at that. You've gotten, you're just so kind and caring. And, you know, they'd say to me, I just, I can't do that. Cause I care too much. <laughs> you get, you know, I mean, people, yeah. people don't live forever in a hospital, they either leave one way or another. So you can't, you know, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think that you have so much empathy for people, but then seeing them in the worst times of their life is it, it, so heartbreaking. Right. Uh, and the people who can do that every day and, and give that full support, uh, like I said, it, it's a sense of awe I look at them with. Because uh, I just, I, I've, I've got a, just the most mild taste of it. And uh, it's just incredible. Right. So how would you say that your, your faith background uh, helped inform your, your work and understanding of chaplaincy? I, I always think that I have a very unique opportunity as a Buddhist um, because I, I feel my faith allows for me to minister and practice, practice with people of different faiths without compromising my own. Right. Um, you know, if a Christian wants to pray, you know, I'm not going to ever lie about what I believe, right. but if they're comfortable with that and they still want prayer, which a lot of them have, I don't have any problem praying a Christian prayer because fundamentally uh, it's like a work, uh, a piece of compassion. It's something right. that is going to help that person. Um, you know, if it makes them more comfortable, uh, uh you know, as long as I'm the one invited to to do something. Uh, I will never present myself as a fake priest or, you know, present myself as something I'm not. But if, if they still say, you know what, I still want this. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm more than happy um, to do that if it's going to help them in some regard. And I don't feel as if I'm betraying my own faith tradition, as long as I'm open and honest about what I am and what I'm doing. Uh, it's also why I love interfaith work. Uh, I, I love that opportunity. 
Um, Buddhism, yeah. I think, has a particular, or at least Mahayana Buddhism in particular, uh, which is kind of a broader branch of Buddhism. Um, we use a uh, skillful means, upaya, uh, you know, these things that, um, as long as it doesn't have to be fully accurate, as long as it's doing the work, um, telling a story, even if the story is not historically factual, if it brings across a message that will get someone to a better state of mind, to, to gain them wisdom right. and compassion, it's okay to do that. And that's kind of how I feel about some aspects of chaplaincy, that you have to work with the person in a way that they're going to understand and respond to. Um, it's mm -hmm. not lying. It's not being false, but it's just working in the context of a person's life and background and history and education level and just all the intersections of their identity that you can understand to get them to a better place. Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I think is my perspective on Buddhism and chaplaincy work. So I think that that is built into the faith tradition. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really strong, um, strong aspect of the work of having to understand and communicate in different ways. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, I'm trying to remember who the quote is, but I'm, I'll just have to just say a, a wise person, <laughs> <laughs> but they just, there was an idea that you know, we, we just have forgotten the value of stories in our culture. We've really forgotten the value and power that has because we really are a narrative species. <laughs> like oh, we, yeah. we understand things best through stories and through, you know, kind of structure in that way. We, you know, it's, we've, we've kind of lost it in some ways. We want to get, you know, like, because, you know, science doesn't tell you stuff in a storyline. It just gives yeah. you the raw effects. And uh, there's uh, something, Yeah. A good friend of mine who's also a minister uh, within Buddhism, the same tradition, he says, you know, we're, we're not homo sapien, we're homo narratus. Uh, mm. I don't know if that's a quote from somebody else that he keeps saying, but it, <laughs> right. like uh, Christopher Sensei, that, that's, that's, uh, that's for you. Uh, but yeah, he, right. myth is so important. And I think people forget that myth does not mean fairy tale. Myth yeah. is a great explanatory system to understand ourselves. Um, within my tradition, Pure Land Buddhism, like I said, there's this cosmic buddha amida buddha and we understand this as a myth but in the greatest sense of the word that this is a narrative that takes place not within historical time mm -hmm. but it, it, it what it teaches and what it resonates in our hearts is real but it doesn't have to be historical you know, right, i think right. that's the big thing people misunderstand they look at the faith tradition and they say Oh, there's these cosmic Buddhas and Buddha lands far off. And, you know, there's all these really wild things, but they, they take it thinking, well, it has to be historical. You know, this is, this yeah. is what religion isn't like that. This is no, it's, it doesn't have to be historical in the same way that I think people uh, look at other faith traditions. And I think that uh, maybe that's another aspect of chaplaincy and Buddhism that we embrace myth as long as it's leading towards something greater. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, again, just 100% agree. I, what got me into my own studies was I did a lot of stuff of history of like the Bible and that kind of thing. And the big thing I tell people whenever they ask me about it is I always say, let me just tell you, this is not the same thing as theology. <laughs> and it yeah. never should be confused. Um, this is not, you can't base a religion off of history. You can't do that. It's just not going to work. And you need, you're right. You need these more power, something more powerful than history. Yeah. And opinion. even, yeah. even historical happenings. I mean, I think the Greeks were very smart in their myths that they, they took certain aspects that were historical. Let's say the Trojan war, you know, that happened, mm -hmm. but you know, they put a narrative onto it that, that informed right. them of something, you know, whether you agree with it or not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Greek myth person I, I have some friends who are so I'm not even going to get into that but you know the idea that you put myth on history to emphasize something is very important and uh, I also yeah. say you relating this back to chaplaincy I think it's really important to allow people to make myths of their own life and put their lives mm. in mythical context um, and that helps a lot I think I think giving a narrative to to especially in hardship or in joy uh, being able to give that opportunity to to make stories, uh, yeah, it's very helpful. You know, absolutely. I mean, um, can you talk any more about? It? Are there any other 
you know, aspects of, of um, any particular like practices that uh, from Buddhism that uh, you used in your chaplaincy experience, either, you know, with people or just for yourself to keep yourself uh, going during this time? Sure. I mean, I'm trying to think what that would be kind of related to that. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, good practice, again, this is, I, I think, where some of the secular kind of area fails uh, in being able to provide things like this. But, um, you know, I think that there's a recognition that there's so little we as humans can do sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you just, you, you take your, uh, I'm not going to give any specific instance, but like, you know, there's the joke, you, you want to fight cancer, you know, you want to like, you know, grab your fists and fight it, you know, and do something. And wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to do, but we can't, you know, right. there's, we're limited. So I think that um, however you take it, you know, even the idea of prayer or for Buddhism, it's chanting Dharani or chanting mantra, the idea that, um, there's some agency that we can have. There's something we can rely on. Uh, I chant often, and it's one of my main practices. I mean, as, as a Pure Land Buddhist, our main practice is chanting the name of the Buddha, you know, over mm. and over again. That, that's, that's the practice of Shin Buddhism, the, the, the Mutsu. You know, doing Dharani for healing or for care for others, uh, not only I think that, you know, sure, you know, talking faith, you know, maybe you do have faith in that. You know, I, I, I you know, attribute certain things to, forces beyond my own understanding but um at least it gives you an outlet to i mean unfortunately i think there's so many people who just bottle it up and that frustration and fear and anxiety that having a religious practice is so important and i think for me as a buddhist being able to release that um feeling of needing to do something uh especially when it's beyond my control and giving it a, a allowing other power, as we say, to, to take over and do its work. Um, to realize, hey, I'm a foolish being and there's only so much I can actually do. Um, right. Yeah, there's a humility to it. And I think a humility that leads to, uh, I don't want to say relaxation, but relief, existential mm -hmm. relief, maybe, yeah. is, a, is a good word to put. Yeah, uh, and I think that's for chaplains or anyone working within that field. Um, that's a big responsibility uh, to have, and I think people just uh, don't know how to deal with it. And that's something that I think it's taken me a while to to start to understand. I don't even understand it fully, but to start to understand how to deal with it from the side of the caregiver, because uh, yeah. unfortunately, it's a classic. Therapists need therapists, priests need priests, you know, yep. uh, who's taking yep. care of the doctors and the nurses. And since we the pandemic, right. we know how horrible uh, nurses have been uh, dealing with it and what they've had to see. So who's taking care of the nurses? You know, that's a question I think we really need to ask too. Right. Um, I was going to ask about um, had a question, but I'll, I'll start with this. Oh, I know what it was. Um, wait a minute. Um, oh yes. Wait, let me just ask this first. I'll come back to this. Sure. I, 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 um, so when, when did you do your, uh, your chaplaincy? Because you were just talking about COVID oh, a little sure. bit. Were you during that? Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of have had two though. I've, I've talked about the medical one. I think that was the end of 2018. Uh, that's mm -hmm. when I graduated from my undergraduate work. So I did that for about half a year, I'd say with my internship. Uh, and then I, I was very lucky enough during, during the, the, the midst of the pandemic, I had started um, interning with the Office of Spiritual Inclusion at Moravian with the chaplains okay. there. So I, got, I also now have experience with college chaplaincy, which okay. is a whole different world. Uh, yeah. And I think one I might be better suited for um, because I think, okay. so I've been doing that. I'm still more or less doing it. There's, you know, it's been so busy that I'm more and more shadowing. Uh, than anything just watching how it's working which is still a really great educational tool oh yeah but, um yeah no, I, I have experience with the life of a college chaplain and seeing what they do and how they handle it uh and that's been all maybe two years of work with that being able to kind of stick around and watch um and i'm i'm, I'm doing it up today yesterday i was with the chat with the chaplains at lunch and thursday i'll be over there doing their dinner nights helping and kind of uh, watching what's going on just being part of the community yeah. 
Um, I want to get back to your college chapter, but I just remember what I was going to say earlier, um, which was what you talked about with the idea of just kind of the way we approach illness. Um, I, I took a class last semester about just, it was just called dying and grieving. I mean, people who are going to be ministers are going to be around that a lot. And um, one thing Professor talked about is she was like, it's so unhealthy the way we talk about this, especially in terms of, like you said, fighting cancer. You have to fight it. And it's like, that's really not a great way to approach it. Um, you know, because it, it, like, it looks at this way of, well, there's winners and losers. And it's like, well, no, that's not how we need to approach life in general. Yeah. So, Sometimes you have to learn to live with things, I think. Right. Like, that's very hard. And um, it's not giving in. I think that there's that fighting loser mentality. But, you know, yeah. obviously, we, the best opportunity is to get past it or right. cure whatever it is. But I mean, you know, I think that uh, part of it, there are people who live with lifelong chronic conditions that they're, yeah. uh, we need to accept that there are certain things people will never get over. And But the question right. is now, how do we live with it? How do we have a good quality of life? despite um, things that are very difficult. Um, and yeah. I think that's, a, that's also something we have to look at because uh, some people, it's like, well, you're not dying, therefore, what is, you're good. You're just, right. uh, we're only interested if you're in critical condition, but there's a lot of people who are lifelong sufferers of various physical, mental, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, <laughs> illnesses that I think the chaplaincy also has to look at. And uh, I think right. it does look at, I just don't think it gets a lot of coverage. Yeah. I mean, I, that was one thing we talked about a lot is people will just think of hospice. They'll say, well, that's losing, that's giving up. And it's like, not necessarily at all. No, not necessarily. I mean, look, I, 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 I had, um, I was taking care of, uh, maybe this is part of it. I was taking care of my grandmother who was slowly in the process of passing. And it, I mean, she took a while, she took her time. And I say that just because, <laughs> You know, she, uh, there came a certain point where she was ready, uh, but right. unfortunately her body was not. So she was just waiting around. And, you know, that's, it's not, at that point, it's not losing and winning. Like she said, like you said, it's, uh, she's ready. Right. Uh, now it's almost uh, frustrating for her, at least watching that she's like, right. I got to go through all this now. I got to wait around <laughs> and I feel like, I feel terrible. She got all of her, you know, when, when someone is ready to pass and, you know, uh, medically that's where they're going sometimes passing is a gift sometimes seeing someone no longer be in pain uh it's not right. a, a, a losing thing like you said that that's a very difficult thing for a lot of people to understand but when you see it first <coughs> uh, when you finally go all right it's over you know thank god think think whatever divine powers there is that this is no longer happening uh, it's strangely a relief, um, and it's hard. It sounds cruel sometimes, but I think that if you're not, if you've not experienced it, uh, it it's a hard thing to grasp. But uh, like you said, yeah, it's not a. It, it's so complex sometimes. <coughs> yeah, and I think that's the main thing, just to get beyond that binary of winning losing. I think that's the the biggest part of it. Um, so yeah, college chaplaincy. Talk about that some more. Um, you said it's different and you are interested in it. So, yeah. Of course, there are some times where there are medical issues going on and there are life and death circumstances because no one is um, uh, unfortunately exempt from that possibility. At the same time, there, college is such a transitionary time for people. It's a time for people to grow up the time when people find themselves and that's also mm -hmm. just as valid and, and, and difficult for a lot of people as the end of life you know sometimes it's a beginning of new life a beginning of new identity and mm -hmm. I, I think that that's more well where I'm well suited for um I like that environment uh there are areas where it's a lot more um happy. <coughs> uh, there are you share a lot of great joys with people and finding who, I, who they are and what they're doing and what they want to do. There's heartbreak, <laughs> relationships, friendships end, betrayals happen. Um, but I think it's an important time for young people, 
to have someone like a chaplain. I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll give every praise I can to the chaplains at Moravia and Tunica and Laura. They're fantastic. Uh, I'm being able to do that and being able to be a support system and to be able to give, you know, a real conversation, sometimes having to say things people don't want to hear, but need to hear, um, to be a guide and to be a mentor to kids. Uh, and I say kids, I mean, young adults. Right. Um, I, I still call myself a kid half the time. You know? <laughs> so I don't mean that with disrespect. To, uh, no, no, I, I didn't take it that way. So, oh, uh-oh. That's my fire alarm. <laughs> um, okay. I think is it, it's not too distracting, is it? <laughs> Luckily, I, it's probably far louder for you than it is for me. No, that's going to be distracting. Um, wait, <laughs> let me see if I can uh, go to the library. Um, sure thing. If you want to, I can actually answer uh, or talk a little about what, what, uh, what's put in the chat while you do that. So I'll fill up airtime. Uh, let's see. Uh, in the chat, it says, this conversation is making me think a lot about the intersection of disability and religion, the tension that some folks face between blessing equal healing or proof of having enough faith. Yeah, that is, um, that's a huge uh, thing in my, in my development, my own faith tradition and understanding that uh, there's a lot of frustration. In, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try not to be negative, but uh, I think part of the reason why I got interested in religion is because of seeing the harm religion has done to people. Uh, and I think faith and, and healing and the idea of good health equals good faith uh, was one uh, immense frustration and anger in my uh, development. I think one of the most important books I read that made me want to understand the good aspects to chaplaincy and health was a book by uh, James Randi, who is not a name you probably hear in a lot of religious circles in good nature. He was kind of a uh, skeptic. He uh, kind of, I don't want to say anti-religion, but very skeptical of religion. But uh, he was a really important person in my, in my religious education because he was skeptical and he asked a lot of really hard questions. And one of the things he did was, uh, he was very influential in exposing faith healers and people who were, I mean, more or less scamming and grifting people who were in, uh, were very sick, were disabled, and had that ex same thing. We're telling people, well, the reason why you're not healing is because you don't have enough faith, or you, or in some of the worst circumstances, you've not given me enough money. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really uh, bad dynamic we have in the United States. Um, some of my thesis work deals with the rise of what I've been calling ultra-conservative Christianity. And uh, I don't want to put that into political words. I say conservative in the, the, the idea of um, viewing the Bible as very literalistic uh, in, in every single aspect. Um, they tend to be kind of conspiratorial thinking, but uh, you see this as very powerful groups, uh, those with a lot of money and a lot of prestige. Uh, and they seem to have that kind of dynamic of uh, the, the, the prosperity gospel is very prominent. Uh, you give money to us, you get money back. Uh, kind of rambling here at this point, but um, yeah, uh, unfortunately the idea of those who are doing well are those who have faith and those who are poor, sick, disabled. Uh, those are ones without faith. Those are ones who are wrong. And that's so completely opposite of what I've experienced. And I think it's a, it's a shame. I, was, I think it was very interesting. I talked to my professor who's a Moravian priest as well, or I don't know if they used to term priest, he, ordained in the Moravian church. And he said, you know, I never much liked the idea of heresy, but then I think of the prosperity gospel. I say, well, maybe sometimes heresy is appropriate term. And I would have to agree with him on that. Uh, Love yeah. that. Thank you. And it looks uh, like we've lost JM for a moment. So we're gonna wait for him to pop back on. Um, for those listening, my name is Chelsea Jackson. I'm the Community Partnerships Director, Interfaith Philadelphia. 
and usually running um, tech behind the scenes for these interviews. But I'll go ahead and just um, ask a question around, you know, can you share a story or um, a moment in your work where you provided chaplaincy services to someone who was of a different faith tradition for you and what was that like? And, you know, in particular, was it a moment that stretched you or stretched your understanding? Sure. I'm trying to think because there's, you know, there's a lot of different circumstances. Um, one of the issues, I think, that, not issues, aspects of chaplaincy that I think people don't realize if you've not experienced it is so often while religion is involved, there's a human aspect that transcends that. There, there is desires and fears and issues that I think go beyond religion. And I think that's where you connect with people. So I'll, I'll give one example that I was very, I think personally very transformative to me in thinking about how to talk to people was uh, there was a family where, uh, you know, I'm not gonna give details. One of them was very sick and they were very frustrated because they were having issues understanding the dynamics of their own faith. They were Christian and saying, why isn't God healing? Uh, and, and, you know, should I accept medical help when I have faith in God that God will heal this, you know, for my family member? And they were having a very difficult tension. And uh, I was with the chaplain there, you know, shadowing and kind of talking. And we got to talking about the idea of the Trinity. Uh, within Christianity and how you had different elements of the Trinity, you know, the, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and how each work with each other and that there was a dynamic of needing to work with different elements. And the chaplain there, when we were talking about this, talked about how well, there's almost a Trinity too in healthcare. He says, look, there's the family and what the family can do. And there's what God, what God can do. And there's what the doctors and what the doctors can do. It says that there is a need for faith and a need for inner workings with all three dynamics. Um, and that we, you have to be accepting and, and open to these dynamics. Uh, and that trying to just say, well, I'm going to do just one. I'm going to rely on just one of the, this, this larger uh, pool of connection and disregard the other two. Says, well, you wouldn't do that in Christianity. You know, you wouldn't say, well, I'm only going to deal with the son and not care about the father or the spirit. He says, well, at the same time, you're saying, well, I'm only going to rely on God. I'm not going to rely on the doctors. I'm not going to rely on what we can do. You know, I thought that uh, and when the, in that conversation, seeing how the chaplain, uh, who I think in this case was Jewish, if I remember who I'm talking about, but seeing how they approached uh, their understanding of the, the, the family state tradition and the issue that was happening with them and being able to put it into terms they could understand, even though they weren't part of the faith tradition they were talking about. I think that was very transformative in seeing how what they did is they took the person's religion, they took it with respect, and they say, well, how do I relate this situation to what they know in their faith? Uh, and I think they did it in a way which was respectful, which connected well with the family. Uh, and it didn't compromise their own faith tradition. So I, I hope that's kind of answering the question. And I, I thought that was a, a great just example of how I could do that in the future and, you know, how I tried to communicate issues uh, to people, you know, or by, by looking at their faith tradition and relating it back to their own life and uh, relating to something we could both understand as humans. So yeah, that, that's, hopefully that answers that question. I see a thumbs up on the screen, so hopefully that works. Uh, hello, Jam. Welcome back. All right. Uh, I'm sure things were very entertaining without me. So <laughs> we managed. Um, we managed. That was that was very exciting. So I think somebody might have burned a panini or something for lunch, but <laughs> so. Well, now you um, get to enjoy the yeah. nice day out. I, I know that's there's kind of a trade off there. So this this part's good at least, and we get the wonderful New Jersey traffic behind us. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, so one thing I was wondering is, uh, you know, you've, you've talked a lot about your, how you had 
you the hospital was like, okay, that's not quite for me. You enjoy the college chaplaincy. So what are you planning on doing? What kind of work do you intend to do in your uh, post-graduation? You know, I always say it's only half of a joke, but I only plan two days in advance because uh, anything else is far too unpredictable to actually plan for. <laughs> um, but no, th there's a truth to that, that yeah, if I had yeah. that, mm -hmm. going with chaplaincy and kind of a hospital, not, not in a hospital, not in medical chaplaincy, but in you know, uh, education or another field, I would absolutely jump at that opportunity. But at the same time, I don't know what's out there. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a lot of exploring, a lot of testing, um, gonna talk to a lot of people now that I'm soon to graduate and kind of see where I'm going. Uh, I'm just gonna see where the world takes me, what, you know, uh, whatever other, uh, the, the other powers in this world have for me, I'm just gonna try to be open to it. Um, yeah, maybe I will do some some chaplaincy in the future. I, I would love that. Uh, maybe I'll continue my education, look for doctrinal work, uh, because education is very important too. Uh, and I, I, I would love to be able to help educate people who may have the opportunity to do things that I'm not suited for. Uh, and that's just a way to give back to a community too. So yeah, what's in the future for me is uh, unwritten. And uh, we'll see what karmatic seeds bloom. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that kind of approach. I mean, we, I think too often, especially, I think in more current generation, it's like the approach is to just, okay, you got to be focused. You got to study this forever and ever. You got to know what you're going to do. You should have been thinking about this in middle school, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a lot of negativity in that kind of thing. I mean, you know, some people, some people are like that, but I think there's a lot of damage in, that, in saying that has, everybody has to be. Um, I mean, I, the amount of times I've changed my mind about what I want to do, you know, I would have gone to seminary four years ago. So. Oh, yeah. I never thought I'd go to seminary, but here I am. Um, and I think the thing is, right. uh, uh, we're both quite young, all of us here talking. And I think for older generations, it was a little bit more secure to have a, a long-term plan. But I think in the past 10 years, since 2010 to, or 2012 to 2022, I think the whole world, at least in America, uh, probably the whole world, has just seen how unpredictable the future is. We've had a lot right. of social change. We've had a lot, you know, the pandemic has upset everyone's idea of what the future was going to be. So the idea of really planning a future in, in a lot of detail, I think, has just become kind of silly. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next two years? I mean, every year something so strange happens now that uh, it's hard. Uh, there's actually a weird comfort in my mind that, you know, coming out saying, oh, I have no idea what we're going to do for, for our job. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, neither does most of the country now. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So it's not good, but at least, um, at least I'm not alone in that. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's, and I think kind of stepping into that unpredictability and there's, and, and like you said, there's, there's so much I've taken out of my life from stuff that I, you know, I was like, okay, I'm spending time on this project, but this, this isn't going to be what I'll do. And I think that's, yeah. you know, I, so that's, I guess a question I can ask off of that is, you know, how do you think, you know, even if you don't go into working as a chaplain, how do you think that experience has, has change you have you have you gained what experience have you gained from what knowledge as, as how do you think it'll benefit you in the long term oh i think that um just everyone in life is going to have to be there to support people whether that's mm -hmm. our friends or family or significant other i think that there are aspects that i've learned myself and how to support uh i think one of the best ones is just the fact that you can't solve issues sometimes Sometimes the best thing to do is just be there. Uh, right. Just, just sit with someone in their sadness and their fear and their anger and not try to solve the situation. And uh, I think that's really hard right. for people. It, it's been hard for me. I, I'm a, I, I tend to be a problem solver. I like to sit there and go, well, what can we fix about this? And uh, it's, it's hard not to do that even yet, but uh, I've learned the value in that. Um, I've learned the value in reaching out for help. Uh, I think that everyone can use a, a, you know, a chaplain, a therapist, a priest, some kind of right. support, and uh, you don't have to do it alone. Um, I guess for me, I think one huge lesson was the ability to say, I'm not cut out for this. 
Uh, this isn't for <laughs> yeah. me. You that's know, a lesson. Um, yeah. This is really hard and this is affecting me in a way that's not great. Um, I've, you know, that's hard to do. And I think that, uh, I'm really glad that I learned that, that I didn't put all my, my chips in the, uh, you know, into medical chaplaincy and then finally get back into it and go, Oh no, this is, this is really right. not what I should be doing. And, uh, yeah, there, there's, I guess, an aspect of humility and just to be able to say not everyone's cut out for everything. And, uh, even right. if that's, I, I wanted to be a medical chaplain, I think early on, and, uh, it's taken me a while to realize that's probably not the best path for me. And, uh, it's hard, mm -hmm. but it's also good because I, I now have looked into different paths that I didn't think I'd consider before. Uh, but yeah, I mean, chaplaincy, being a caregiver, being someone, a lot of empathy that goes into that, a lot of, um, considerations just to what people are going through uh and the hidden things people are going through that uh you don't get to see and uh, just a recognition that when someone explodes in anger or is, is is pulling out of something you know we don't know what they're going through and there could be so much uh i think just just that knowledge of what happens every day in the hospital and, and what's happening in, in young people's lives that you don't see the the transformative qualities of, of coffage, uh, uh, finding out who you are, who your friends are, yeah. who they're not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's just a lot to it. And uh, it just gives you a wider consideration of what other people's lives actually entail. So maybe that's kind of a, a very big overview of just, it's an insight that I don't think uh, yeah. we'll get to the very intimate parts of other people's lives. You know, I think you're absolutely right. It's, and that's and that's such a hard lesson for all of us to to even be able to just say is I'm not good at this thing, or I don't. You know, I mean, that's something all of us want to be great at everything, but that's simply not, not true. And and I I will also I felt the same experience. Like I said, after taking that that death and dying class, I I don't plan on being a pastor or being ordained or serving in that capacity. But I just kind of called that being a good human class. <laughs> Learning yeah, yeah. how to just be a good human. And I think from what I've heard a lot of people talk about chaplaincy, it's just like that's there's a lot of truth in that too, you know, from from the experience that you've talked about today. It's like it's just it's just part of being a human and learning how to how to go through those steps. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of uh summing it down, but sometimes we're not heroes and sometimes all we can do is sit there and say, Wow, this uh this sucks. Let's right. just let's just let it be bad. You know, there's nothing we can yeah. do and uh, trying to sit there and cheer people up and oh, think of the, you know, no, this is rough. This is bad. And that's hard for people to understand. And uh, I think it's hard for people to uh, accept that you can say that yeah. sometimes because uh, when I'm in a really bad situation, I don't want to hear, oh, well, maybe this, maybe that. And, oh, hey, this is rough. Just let it be. You know, yeah. We're here for you. We'll take every opportunity we can. But right now, you're going through a rough time. That's uh, yep. sometimes that's all people need to hear. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite books of the Bible is is Job. You know where he just everything just his whole family is killed and he loses everything and you know his friends come to sit with them and the mistake they make is they all try to answer why this happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's the worst thing you can do is just do that. It yeah. happened because it happened. Right. Well, um, we've got about a couple minutes left here, and I, I just wanted to give you a minute to share any final thoughts or um, you know, just reflect on anything you'd like to share here at the end. Sure. I mean, I guess all I can say is, you know, interfaith work and the ability to move beyond our own faith traditions and learn from others uh, is so important in this kind of work. Uh, and to have a pluralistic society where we can all exist together. Um, I love talking to people of different faith traditions than my own. Um, I think yep. one aspect that I, I want to really focus on in the future too is that's very important is those who don't have a faith tradition, those who are mm -hmm. not part of an organized religion. I think those yep. are people who get overlooked. Um, and it's important to, to how do you chaplain to someone who doesn't have a faith? Uh, and right. that's becoming a lot more people. And uh, I don't think yeah. that spirituality is dying, but I think organized religion is having a difficult time keeping people. And we have to, as pastors, priests, chaplains, 
interfaith work people, social workers. We need to look into those who have been hurt by religions um, and who are no longer going to return to them. And that, that's the reality we have to face, but they still need chaplaincy. They still need right. spiritual support, whether that a, you know, whether that's just the human spirit, whether that's just emotional support, it doesn't matter. And I think I think that's a new avenue of study and research and practice we need to be more looking into. And I think that's uh, a big part of my future too. So I think that's kind of what uh, one aspect that is not being talked about a lot that I, I'm trying to start the conversation on more and. It's one that we don't have an answer to. It's one that's in development. Uh, we're going to need a lot of different people from different faiths, different backgrounds, different expertise uh, looking at it. So yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, something important to me that I guess I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see how people like you are going to engage with those questions in the future. Because you're right, it's, it's, it's very important. And it's not talked about enough. So I, I can't wait to see what happens. So um, well, Levi, thanks again. This has been a, a great, great time hearing your opinions on this. I feel like I could talk to you much longer. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So once again, just thanks so much. And um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say more than just, you know, I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah, I've I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very yes. much. Mm -hmm. All right.